We are back with Cocktails with Queens and joining our queendom and helping us kick off Black History Month is the CEO of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. Please welcome Dr. Bernice King. Hello. Hello. How are you all, Queens? Hello. How are you? One queen to uh, four more queens. Okay. Well, we appreciate you being here. Dr. Bernice, I'm going to call you Dr. Bernice. Now, what's it like to to carry on your father's legacy? Whoa, that's a that's a heavy burden there. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, yeah. Um, you know what? It, it is a heavy burden. Uh, not just because of my dad, it's because of my mom. Uh, because, you know, in reality, the reason that Dr. King is who he is today is because of everything she did. Um, even before he was assassinated, there's so much stuff that she did to begin to prepare the way for his legacy and then became the architect of that legacy. Um, and because of that, you, we know the iconic Dr. King. We have access uh, to so many of his teachings and, and words. And so, you know, it's, it's real heavy carrying two parents who, who have a global legacy. Um, but you know what? I learned a, a, a couple of, I don't know, it was two years ago, really in the midst of the pandemic, uh, I finally surrendered um, because I was, I was wrestling with this thing about Bernice's legacy you know, your parents' legacy. And I finally realized that in my particular situation, I really inherited a legacy. And so it's not about carving out a unique kind of legacy for me. It's more about getting in line with this legacy and determining what I need to do to continue to build upon it uh, and contribute to it and, and cement things for the future. So that has eased my burden because before it was like, I can never measure up. I mean, who, who can measure up to people in their death who are still speaking to people, who are still directing people and guiding people and inspiring people? You can't. <laughs> That's got to be tough. I'm glad my father never made it to the NBA and my mother can't really cook because I don't really have no big <laughs> shoes to fill. <laughs> I got my bars here. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, no, seriously, Bernice, yesterday you posted some really beautiful photos of you and your mother, Coretta Scott King, in honor of the 16th anniversary of her passing. So again, you you spoke on this, but what does your mother's legacy mean to you and to to Black women all over the world? It's such a a strong, powerful, and beautiful figure and and example for us. Yeah, I mean, she uh, single-handedly, and yeah, she had supportive family uh, and friends, but, you know, she really became, um, people talk about wind beneath the wings. Sometimes she was the wings uh, of my father because, you know, he, they got clipped a lot when he spoke out against the Vietnam War. Those people who worked with him in the civil rights movement criticized him publicly. A lot of people kind of alienated him, uh, but she was right there with him. In fact, encouraging him because she was a part of the peace movement uh, even before they met. So she was encouraging to lend his voice to the peace movement um, and she really was this incredible coalition builder um, and strategist. You know, when we talk about that movement, women were strategists. Uh, we, we don't know that because we, we, you know, we hear a lot about the men and the work that they did, but women were, were serious strategists uh, in pulling things together. They, they actually, they did uh, quite a bit. <laughs> There wouldn't have been a movement. So a strategist, a coalition building builder. Um, and, and I want to just say something about my mother from a personal sense, because a lot of people don't know this. As busy as she was, my mother could be on the phone talking to, you know, a president, a prime minister, an ambassador, uh, on the phone with someone in her office. Um, and, and she was just attentive to everybody that she was engaged with. But she had this personal touch. She was very thoughtful and kind. And I got, I got to share this because when I used to go with her, literally to the Hallmark stores when they had them, she would spend three hours in that store and she had a list of every month. So she would do a quarter at a time of everybody she wanted to get a card for. Mm. And she sat there and read through the card. It wasn't like, hey, y'all, I got to get a card and make sure somebody, you know, I, they know that I, you know, acknowledge their birthday. No, she was being very intentional about the words on that card. And if they fell short, she would write a little extra in that card. So there are many people today that say, I got a card from Coretta Scott King. That card came from her. She picked it out. She chose it. And she she put her imprint on it, her personal imprint. So she was a very 
kind and caring and thoughtful uh, woman as well. Um, but I call her the architect of the King legacy. That, that's my title for her. Wow. You, um, I have to ask more about your mom because what you've just said is, has just, you know, has just motivated and inspired me so much. Um, we know so much about your father, you know, mm -hmm. over the years we've studied him and, but I love how there are so many more layers to your mom. And I would like to know, um, once, you know, the civil rights movement was kind of, you know, we were in the thick of the civil rights movement and your father was assassinated. What were some of the things, or was there one thing that stood out to you that was impactful that your mom did? that really solidified his legacy, that helped to solidify his legacy um, even while he was gone, especially being a mom and taking care of you guys and keeping it all together. But politically, what are some of the things that she did to ensure um, that his legacy is um, stayed as strong as it is even up to this day? Well, the first thing is she uh, and my father um, really embodied the, those nonviolent teachings and the power of love um, and love in action and love at work, um, uh, which forgiveness is also part of, because she very well could have been a very bitter uh, woman uh, after that uh, assassination. Um, and with the way that they violated our family with, you know, um, um, what do they call those taps, wiretaps and all kind of stuff. Um, but she wasn't. Um, she she carried on in a spirit of love and grace uh, and dignity and was determined to institutionalize the legacy. Mm -hmm. And for her, that was building the King Center uh, from the very beginning, two and a half months after his assassination. She founded the King Center, started it in her, in her uh, bedroom and then built out our basement and had offices initially there. And eventually we, went, we ended up where we are on Auburn Avenue, which is the street where my father was born as well, the home where he was born. Um, but through the King Center and institutionalizing the, the legacy of nonviolence and how nonviolence was utilized to bring about social change in that time, because she wanted to ensure this generation would have those teachings. And that's why we continue that, that work today. And then just the holiday, I mean, she, she was determined to make sure that this nation uh, does not forget uh, the teachings uh, of Dr. King because she felt it was instrumental in creating the just, humane, equitable and peaceful world. Um, so I would say, you know, it, 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 that, was, that was really where she poured her heart and, and soul and just the fact that it came out of her, it, you know, that's who she was. She, she walked in it, she embodied it, she carried it and she loved doing the work. Girl, let, let me let me say this. And, I, and I, you I, met her, Lisa. You remember right. at the trumpets. I, and, I, and I was going to say, when I say girl, I don't mean that disrespectful because no. when our friends, we've talked. I'm heavy right now and very emotional because your parents and you are monumental. Mm -hmm. And your mother had so much love and grace. And you are mm -hmm. absolutely right. I was having a problem with my daughter at the Trumpet Awards. And there's a picture of us where I am knelt down. She is holding my chin up. And she told me, let the Lord handle this and believe in my prayers. I don't think I've ever seen wow. your mother in a picture that's crying. She's always held her head up high and very dignified. I... We need more women. Like that. And I know we don't know a lot about your personal life, but I heard you say that those are huge shoes to fill and that you were in denial for a while. And when you have parents like that, you struggle to go, what am I going to do? Exactly. What am I going to be? Am I going to, to even rise up to be able to be half of that? I want to go inside the life of them with you. Just give me a little bit of when you were little, when you were young, what are some of the things that you took away from your mom's life that you say that you do now, that you just remember? You know, uh, I kind of take away from my life with my mother the things she said a lot in the household because that was important for me because I went through years of a lot of anger 
mm. um, and bitterness. And eventually I began to hate all white people, especially white men. Um, you know, and I think because of her example and the seeds that she sowed, this is why I really understand now the Bible verse that says, train up a child in the way uh, she should go. And when she's old, she will not depart from it. Um, because she really did train me up that way. And she used to always talk to us about love and forgiving the person who killed your, your father. Um, and um, she would always say, you know, somebody has to cut off the chain of violence in this world, mm. you know? And, and when she said it, I didn't quite connect the dots that she was trying to tell me that you need to be that person uh, until I got a little older. Um, and, and so it was just those incredible examples because I didn't really have the opportunity to spend um, mommy daughter time. That's the part that, you know, I was robbed of because, you know, she, she was very focused and determined to institutionalize the legacy. So I couldn't go, you know, get nails done, you know, go shopping. The one time, other than the Hallmark store, when we went there together because I was with her to learn. You know, and and she, I watched her, and then I went and tried to find cards the same way. Um, uh, but I, the one time we went to the mall, um, everybody stopped her, and it wasn't black people; it was everybody. I mean, we couldn't go like five feet; somebody else was stopping her, and so it became very frustrating. So we never got those those times. Um, we had one or two times when we went to a movie. And I remember we went in the bathroom. Y'all probably, you, you all probably have been through this. Went in the bathroom and we come out and, you know, somebody bombarding you. Can I get your autograph? I'm thinking, she just came out the bathroom. Just let her have peace right, right now. Mm -hmm. And okay. we hanging out. <laughs> you know, so, so I kind of handled it, you know, gracefully uh, with the person and said, hey, you know, let, let's give her some time and, you know, I'll work it out. Um, but, you How know, I. She passed. I was uh, 41 or 42 when she passed, oh, okay. and, I, and I was with her when we were in Mexico. It was, one of, it was the most difficult day in my life. Um, but yeah, but if I tell you anything that she, she really helped me with, I was riding down the street one day, I done, one of the highways here, um, and I was really mad about something. I was enraged, and she stopped me literally because I was getting ready to make a decision. And she stopped me in my tracks and she said, baby, never make a decision in your anger. Ooh, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. I know. And when I tell you, it has saved me over and over <laughs> and over again. So initially I go through what I'm going to do. You know how we are. I'm <laughs> going to tell them off. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. I'm about to. And you get close to doing it and I get arrested. And I say, okay, cool out. Go through this process for now. Be angry because the Bible says be angry, but don't sin in it. So mm. uh, don't do anything you're going to regret later. You may come to the same conclusion because mm -hmm. I, I may have, I didn't come to the same conclusion in this incident and it saved, saved me from making a bad decision. But sometimes you may still come to the same conclusion that I need to do X, Y, and Z, but you need to get your head together. And if nothing else in this world today is too many people letting their anger get them, you know, in, initially. And we got to gotta figure out how to arrest that anger because too many innocent lives are being lost. Um, and it, it's just, it troubles me. It troubles me how to control our world has become. Um, so I thank God for my mom's teachings. I, I do. Love, yeah, a lot of valuable lessons. Switching gears, um, what's the inspiration behind your children's book? It starts with me. Well, you know, last year, this time, the King Center launched uh, a campaign called Be Love. And it was really inspired by my father's words about the connection between power and love, um, where he talks about, you know, the two uh, really needing each other, because if you got love without power, it's kind of weak um, and ineffective. And if you got power without love, it can be reckless and abusive. And so he went on to say that, that power at its best is a love implementing the demands of justice and love at its best, um, um, excuse me, justice at its best is, is, uh, is love correcting everything that stands against love. And so when we launched that campaign uh, to be love, we were trying to get people to understand that we can change the world and we can confront and resist injustice and wrongdoing 
in the right spirit and the right attitude and the right strength because love is strong. It's powerful. Dr. King was not weak. You know, he was not a coward. It was very powerful when he arrested all of that he had in him and was able to face all of that evil um, and cause the transformation that happened. And so through that whole campaign, we said, okay, how can we reach kids? You know, and we came up with this idea to do a children's book because it all starts with each one of us. I know we want to correct everything out there, you know, look out the window and say what's wrong, but we need to look in that mirror, you know, and start the process inwardly because there's some things we got to deconstruct in our own thinking because we've all been processed through, you know, the system of white supremacy, you know, system of individualism and selfishness and all that kind of stuff. Uh, And so we wanted to reach kids with the same message about be loved. So we have a little character. Her name is Amora. This is this is a picture of Amora here. Um, (laughs) And uh, Amora is her her whole mission is to encourage her friends to be loved and to show them how to open their hearts and minds uh, to let love lead them in their words, their actions um, and their thoughts and especially words, because we we overlook that part. Um, and, and to create this, this world where everybody feels like they belong. We call that really the beloved community. Uh, so, you know, things come up about kindness and joy and how love erases hate and forgives, how love pushes you to speak up, you know, how love can drive you to cut off uh, the chain of violence um, and build bridges and fight for justice. So that's why we decided to do this book to reach a whole nother generation. Well, we can listen to you talk about, I mean, just your experience, your life, your family, your own knowledge. And before this interview, I was aware, of course, that your father basically gave his life for the rest of the world, not the country, the world Mm -hmm. to to get on that path to starting to get it together. But now realizing it it wasn't just your dad. It was your dad, your mom, you, your brother, your entire family continues to pour into the world. And we appreciate y'all. I I mean, words can't really express how much we appreciate your entire family. So we thank you. And we would love to have you back in the future because you said some some things. There was so many things. I'm like, I want to know about that. I want to know about that. Like the fact that you even got over your hatred of white men who, you know. Yes, I did. I I mean, that is a whole. We need to bring you back and talk about that one. I need need to tell that girl. Dr. Bernice, we we thank you and we honor you. And I can't think of a better way to kick off Black History Month than speaking to you and and thank you for spending an hour, spending some time with us. Be sure to follow Dr. Bernice King on social media and support her projects in her book. And we appreciate your entire family. Thank you so much, Queen. Thank you. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And once again, please support this sister and all she does. We'll be right back with more cocktails with Queens after this. <laughs> 